and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a, ma a man who, for, a man who is, tr who is apparently trying to outbeard me, one of the, uh, one of the few people who's covered both Veil of the Void and Emberwind at the same level of detail that I have, and a self-proclaimed unofficial cheerleader to the TTRPG community, better known as That Gamer Ajax. How you doing today, man? Or tonight? <laughs> doing, uh, doing pretty well. How, how are you doing? I'm, do I'm doing good. It is starting. To, it is starting to snow, and it's there's enough snow on the ground where I can actually use it as ammo. Because <laughs> what else is snow for than to, than than setting up snowball ambushes when it comes to roommates? Yeah, that is a very very fair point. I would argue that like when you get enough snow, you can go snowmobiling. That's probably the only other thing that's better for it. Uh, but other than that, you're right. That is literally the only good use of snow. I like skiing. I haven't been skiing, but uh, that's still that's still on the to-do list. Oh, I've done so skiing. I'm... I've done snowboarding, and of course, of course, since it's winter, obviously, I've done hockey. <laughs> Gra granted, granted, mo granted, most people, mo some folks don't like how don't, don't like how physical I can get with hockey, but hey, it's a contact sport, and we're all wearing pads, right? Fair enough. Yeah, I, we we used to do that uh, with uh, my brothers and I. We used to go out on the pond, and the, we would do that without the pads. We would just be like, "Yeah, we've got two jackets. One's close enough, right?" <laughs> um, sh um, it depends on it depends on whether or not you've got a tall boy in the group. And well, I was always the tall guy in in any group I was in. <laughs> Yeah, that that definitely was not me. I was the tall one in the family, but that's about the closest that we could get. Mm -hmm. And well, these di these days, people people come up to me at work and then and then say, "Hey, can you hey, can you get something off the top shelf for me?" And then I say, "Yes," and continue working. And I think you know where they went wrong in that story. <laughs> Just saying, you get you gotta ask. Yeah, yeah, you do. So, I'd like to start with the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. Um, walk me through how you first got introduced to tabletop and how, and what made it stick. So, for me, I mean, I mean I'm going to be honest. Like, my introduction to tabletop was is very similar to a lot of other people, especially like around my age. You know, uh, I I was in college. My roommate got like really into Critical Role. He introduced that. He he's just like you know, hey, like you should check this out too, um, and you know, instantly fell in love with it. Never actually like got overly far into it, um, just because sometimes I have some difficulties paying attention to like longer form shows like that. But then he was just like, hey, like I want to do this, and I'd always been interested in like D and D ever since I got into college, and I think that was probably like around the time the fifth edition came out. So my roommate at the time decided to go ahead and buy the beginner box set, and we all had like our pre-generated characters, and we started running through the Lost Mine of Vendover campaign. Um, not long after that, like the the initial group kind of like fell apart. We brought in a couple of new people, we got new characters in it, and we still like continued on with a different story. And then just like I instantly fell in love with like the storytelling aspect of it. And it was just a lot of fun. Uh, and that was probably uh, eight, almost nine years ago now. Uh, and then since then, like I've been able to like make friends through like tabletop gaming, and it, it was initially a lot of D and D. And then like I moved to Texas from Indiana, and met a group of friends that were like wrapping up a campaign. So they let me jump in for like the last six months of it or so. Um, we finished that campaign, and then they started looking into like other games because, of course, like I was following the Critical Role folks, and somebody had like back to this really cool like sci-fi looking game and i'm like oh hey like what's this i read into it it's veil of the void with its first edition and mm -hmm. i instantly fell in love with it and i'm like oh this is cool so i backed it and then like once we wrapped up that campaign 
I was just like, hey guys, so I got this sci-fi like fantasy game. Like, you guys want everyone like give this a shot? And then we started a campaign, and here we are, like nearly three years later, and we are like in the final. I'm hoping to have the campaign wrapped up in probably about two months or so. But we would have like, we've been playing ever since then. We got started like around the same time that it was like a week before lockdowns happened for the COVID nineteen pandemic. Mm-hmm. And from there, I've just been branching out to all sorts of other games, basically whatever I can get my hands on. Yeah, you've and you've done you've done some deep dives uh, on on certain on certain games in a multi part matter. You had done that with all the classes with Veil of the Void, and then later on with Emberwind, mm-hmm. and most recently with um, Cyberpunk Red. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm planning on going a little bit more deep into Cyberpunk Red, but I, it, just for me, I just remember when I was like starting out with Veil of the Void, was I'm just like, okay, like it is a little intimidating to get started with a new system, especially because like everybody that they get introduced through D and D, they think that it's going to be very expensive, and you're going to have to get all these different books. Like, you, there's a lot that you have to do, kind of thing. And like with some of these other games, it's really not that hard. And I just want to be able to be able to teach people that, hey, it doesn't take a lot of money to, like, get started with a more indie game. Like, here's some information that, like, here's the basics to get you started. And I just want to be able to, like, help people see that there is more than D&D out there. Like, I love D&D. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm still playing it in campaigns to this day. I still play it. I enjoy it. But I just found that there are so many other games that are out there that do different things better, in my opinion. And I, um, I've mentioned this. I've mentioned this particular story on multiple occasions in the past. But the big lie that a lot of people talk themselves into when it comes to D and D is the idea that you can use it to run any kind of fantasy setting. Mm-hmm. I call it a big lie because, well, people keep because um, people keep repeating it to themselves and probably unironically believe that. But here, here's the challenge that I tend to give people who who um, who argue that with me, because of for putting a, not to put myself on a pedestal, but if you're going to argue that with me, then as the saying goes, if you come at the king, you best not miss. But let us cons- imagine if let's suppose that I wanted to that I that I wanted to run a more Samurai themed campaign, you know, L five R and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most common way to equip a fighter, or mo- or most martial centric, or most martial centric characters that aren't built around specific kit, is sword and board. Um, long sword, or in some cases, bastard sword, and a large shield. <coughs> Now here's the million dollar question: How do you do? Th- how do you do that? How do you deal with that assumption in a se- in a setting where shields are not a thing? I mean, personally, I would just say take two swords, but that's just me. Well, you take two <laughs> swords, you get a, you get the you have the dual wielding thing, and that's a whole other problem. <laughs> One that one that um no one that no edition of D and D has managed to figure out, except for the one that I'm supposed to not like. But the po- but the point is 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 that there's a I've been very critical over the years of the shit or get off the pot attitude regarding what sort of fantasy D and D is supposed to be, and you probably noticed this when you look at a lot of indie works. That whole that whole question of what sort of what sort of genre it's supposed to encompass encompass is not a problem. I, I the thing is I think that when it comes to D and D is that it it does certain things really well and personally and I know this is like a gripe with some people is that I like the streamlined aspect of Fifth Edition. I think that it is like fairly easy to just like get into and play. Like I've taught people how to play D and have a good time with people that have never played D and D before. But I think that, like, I wouldn't try taking, like, D&D and doing, like, a hard sci-fi setting, for example. Um, I think that there are other systems that handle that a lot better. Um, and, it, like, full disclosure, I'm a huge sci-fi guy. Like, mm-hmm. that's 
part of the huge draw for me with like Veil of the Void and like I love Cyberpunk. I played some Lancer and I've really enjoyed that. Um, like I am just a sucker for like a good sci-fi game. Um, and it's just like I look at the things with D and D, and I'm like, you could maybe make it work, but I just feel that like. Why go to all of the effort on that? And I know that there are a few people that are, like, working on doing, like, sci-fi supplements. And, like, I've looked over some of, like, the materials they've released. And, like, there's some good stuff there. They're, like, there mm-hmm. really is. But I just feel that if I'm going to play D&D, like, I want it to be that kind of, like, sword and sorcery style game. I don't want it to necessarily be, like, low magic. I think that you could do a lot with it. It is a pretty versatile system. But it doesn't do everything. Oh. And it, I, just, I do feel like there are a lot of things that it could do a lot better. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, that's why I have all these other games that I like to play. <laughs> yeah. For me, when it comes to the when it comes to the streamlining thing, I have no problem with with um, the streamlined aspect. I mean, I mean, given given some of the rules light stuff that I ha- that I have in my library, I'd be a hypocrite if I di- if I did. The ish. A lot of the issues that I br- that I've brought up over the years on on my channel and when it comes to D and D throughout the editions is the devils in the details. Uh, I've never been I have for instance I have never been a fan of the spells per day model, also known as the Vancian model. Uh, mostly mostly because of the fact that it that um. When you're tr- when, when it comes to how it works, the set the setting, especially some settings more so than others, doesn't really justify that limitation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- I honestly think that the whole, the whole the whole you can use it to run any kind of fantasy thing is more of a product of people thinking that fantasy begins and ends with that. British Isles Tolkien esque approach, or a pastiche of it. Right. Uh, I'm not entirely. I'm not entirely sure if relying on that as your, as your main entry point is a good idea when you have a whole generation for whom their introduction into fantasy is stuff like The Witcher and Game of Thrones or Dragon Age. Uh, that's fair, um, and, and the best part is, is that I know that when it comes to like all of those games, they all have their own tabletop systems already. I mean, mm-hmm. like I, I personally really want to look into the uh, the Witcher RPG because, like, I like the I've read all the Witcher books, I like the games, uh, like for the most part, um, and I would just be very interested to see like how some of the components of like like of that like translates into a tabletop set. Well, you know who you know who designed that that particular game, right? Yes, I do. I know it's Artelsorian Games, and I know it's the same people that made uh, Cyberpunk at 2020 and Cyberpunk Red. Yeah, there is one more. There is there are a couple more editions of of Cyberpunk, but one of them is the very early days, and the other one is in the hall of we don't talk about that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, I'm, I'm I'm really like I'm just getting into Cyberpunk. Mm-hmm. Right? But interesting, like the system for a bit, but like Cyberpunk Edge Runners was just like. I have to play this game now. Mm-hmm. So that, now that's been my obsession for the last couple of weeks. And we d- we did a deep dive when it came to when it came to Edge Runners because I have because I have a bit I have a bit of history with both Cyberpunk and with um, um, Studio Trigger who animated that. And it was an interesting match, although. I say if, if there was any, if there was any one problem, I'm not I'm not entirely sure if using the li- using the linguistics of edge runners what was a good idea. But that that's that's more of a that's more of a personal nitpick. Um, but when it came to s- the first edition was Cyberpunk 2013. There are only a few books for it because it was really early days. I think that was late 80s. Um, and there's 2020, which is the one everybody knows. It's the one that had the longest run. Then there was third edition, also known as V three. That's the controversial one. <laughs> it it was very very divisive, and some of the weird decisions did not ex- felt like it was leaning f- too far into transhumanist stuff. And we and we have red now, which 
is trying to be a middle ground between 2020 and 2077. There's also some side stuff like cyber generation, but that's getting way too much into the weeds. I, I fancy myself a bit of a historian. But um, there was one. There was one other interlock project that, um, I that truth be told, I'd like I'd like to see get a second shot, or or at least an, or at least a shot with more modern editing systems, and that's Mechton. I, I gotta admit, I'm not familiar with that one at all. Mechton is was um bo was born of the in was born out of the interest in well Mecha. Okay. Oh. Uh, and like, I, like, give me, give me like a good mecha system, and like, I am, I am sold. Like, uh, like Titanfall Two is like one of my favorite, uh, like, game video games of all time. And then like, I grew up like watching like Zoids. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to get more into Gundam. Like, it's like, like, Max. and that's where like I start playing. So I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot of there. Yeah. So I'm just so very curious, like, what some of the other options. Um, Mechton can be very good, but it's but it is built on how customizable you can make you can make mechs. I mean, if you want if you want to go with the more animalistic approach of Zoids, that can be done. If you want to go with so, with something akin to Gundam or Macross, that can be done. If you want to go with tanks with legs, a la BattleTech, that can be done. If you want to go with with full on transformers and com and combiner mechs that also can be done if depend but that has a um that has an upside and a de and a downside the uh, as much as i love lancer lancer is intrinsically tied to its setting i wouldn't be able to use lancer and do a gundam style campaign without doing some heavy heavy editing and by that, by the time I'd be, I'd be by the time I'd be finished, I'd essentially have a, a whole different game. Um, right, fair enough. It's literally like what we were just talking about, like doing like D and D but sci-fi, really. Well, one of my philosophies is that house ruling should be a spice, not the main dish. Oh, yeah, and I, that's fair. And some of that comes from my experience with, um, with tr with. The t with the times where I was running rifts and had and was house ruling a lot of stuff within that game, but the the mech game that I tend to recommend to a lot of people because I find it to be a a nice a nice middle ground between having a bit of crunch but also a bit of flexibility is Battle Century G. Okay. Um, originally, it started out as Giant Guardian Generation and was Meant to emulate the v the variety of mechs that are that are in the Super Robot Wars games, which is a franchise that's been going on for a long time. Okay. But to that, by that I mean the the earliest entries were on, were on the NES. That's how long it's been going. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, NES and Game Boy was where it had its origins in Japan. Man, now we're getting old school. Um, like I said, I'm a his I fancy myself a historian. But after after a while, and because he wanted to, because the designer wanted to go legit with the thing, he rechristened it Battle Century G. Took out the took out all the stuff that would get Bandai mad at him, and made it its own thing. And did one, did one expansion called Battle Century Z, which is meant to. Encompass the more some of the some of the more out there aspects, especially if you want to say magic themed mecha a, a la Dunbine, that's where you'd go. But I cover I covered the original Battle Century G a while a while ago, um, and <clears throat> especially especially since it really only the amount of die that you're going to be using is pretty limited. It's what I would call crunch medium. There's a lot you can do with it, but it's not going to have you get thro get thrown right into the middle of everything and be to and be told swim, damn it. 
but See, that, that, that's like the good sweet spot for me. Like, I'm, I'm like I don't mind a bit of crunch, but like full disclosure, I hate math. <laughs> like, it's part of the reason why, like, why I like Emberwind and it's why I like uh, Veil of Void so much is because I just need to be able to count like how many like like with Veil, how many sixes I get, and then it's just doing damage. Like that's it. I don't like math that much. I've always been more of like a writer kind of person. Like. And it's the one thing that's like holding me back from like getting Starfinder is just because like I've listened to some people play it before. I'm just like, I don't know if I want to be like doing whole math formulas just to play a game. I I I have taken a look at Starfinder, and if I'm being honest, I wasn't all that impressed. I I feel like people have gone back and forth on it. I just think that like. It does sound very interesting to play, and I do think it is something that I would enjoy. I would just have to take some time to get used to it. I mean, like, it, I will probably get it eventually. Like, I've got Pathfinder 2nd Edition right now. Like, I've started looking through that, but, like, I mean, that's a 640-page core book. Like, I'm going to need time to be able to get through that, like, just as it is. And that's not some of the other things that I got. Yeah. Um, part of the reason I wasn't all that impressed with, with um, Starfinder was... I felt that I felt that trying to make it feel like Pathfinder First Edition as close as possible was ultimately to its detriment, including tr including trying to have it somehow take place in the same universe as Pathfinder instead of having it be its own thing. But I, I think that, I think there's some interesting like continuity ideas that are there. But I, again, with somebody that like hasn't really explored Pathfinder, I unfortunately I really can't like comment on that. I just I just have like this actual play that like I listen to and I like I thoroughly enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But I do I know nothing about like the world of Pathfinder or Starfinder. I'm just kind of like oh like let's just like listen to the the laser battles going on. I uh, just did in my headphones because it's. Like the team does a good job on that actual mm -hmm. play. Yeah, and I get the feeling that I prob I probably would have um I probably would have been more receptive to Starfinder if I was in a situation where um Pathfinder was the be all end all for for me when it comes to RPGs, but it obviously isn't. Yeah, <clears throat> and al also. I have to compare it to the gold standard of D, uh, for me of D twenty based space opera that and that is Star Wars Saga Edition. Okay. And once I once I do that, it, it it's not holding up. I realize it's a bit unfair to compare it to a game that's been out of print for a few years, but the thing. The thing that I respect with with um, something like Saga Edition is it taking the D twenty system and instead of trying to bi build D and D in space, it's trying to build its own thing. That's 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 what plays a factor in this kind of situation. Right. But. You admit you had mentioned you had mentioned being a big a big fan of SF. Do you is a lot? Do you lean more towards um, space opera? Do you lean more towards hard SF, or or do you see yourself as doing a mix of all of the above? Uh, I, I'm more uh, like space opera. If if I'm going to be honest, like with the Veil of Void campaign that I've been running for a couple of years now, like mm -hmm. my primary influences with that are Mass Effect and Star Wars. Like I, mm -hmm. I've always liked Star Wars, like ever since I was a kid, and like yeah, like I definitely. I just really like enjoy those properties, and like I want my players to be able to like go on these like heroic adventures in space where they get to like be like kind of like the heroes that they always want to be. Like I try to make my players feel like as badass as possible, and like with the group that I've been playing with, like. They deliver in spades on that, and a lot of the like the really cool moments are stuff that they just entirely come up with. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of like hard sci-fi. Like, the, uh, like I'm definitely a fan of like give me sci-fi, but like with magic, or like give me some like little like a, like easy way to like get around the solar system without having to explain it with without having to know you know like astrophysics and whatnot. I like I just like being able to have fun with a system where I don't need to feel like I ha need to have a degree to be able to play the game. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I hope I you have my sympathies if in in your love for Mass Effect you ended up you ended up going through Andromeda. Uh, I I did. I thought it was okay. I was disappointed in like the overall storytelling of it. I thought like in terms of like gameplay, I think that they they did things right, but the overall story and like the the villains that we were going after were very lacking. I did think that they tried some interesting things like with the crew. I didn't hate the game, but it was one of those like. I, once I put it down, like I'm never going to touch this again. Um, I, I, I find it, I find Andromeda fascinating in the sense that the actual problems that I had requ aren't something that can easily be summarized. I know it's, I know it's easy to pick on the "my face is tired" meme and similar things, but the. I'd say I'd say the I'd say the I'd say the failing of something like Andromeda was them suffering from tunnel vision, you know, trying so hard to make that whole procedurally generated planets thing work. Yeah. When no, but when um the technology, even with the amount of money that Star Citizen keeps pumping out with their attempt at procedural planets, they can't do it. So what chance do you have with even less time? But. Yeah. I really feel though that Andromeda did kind of get screwed like from the get go, just because like they were coming in like after like what's still like in my opinion like a very very good trilogy of games with characters that like you've had time to like develop and like, and there are so many good stories to be told, and then you go into Andromeda with this entirely new cast and it just like less likable people as a whole, and like. It's just, it's so hard to, like, stand on its own. And I, like, I've been actually thinking about, like, going back and revisiting it. Just be like, okay, like, do my, like, do the criticisms that I had of it still hold up? Because I remember there being some really interesting things. And I think that they did some things right. But there were just so many other things that I'm just like, eh. Well, <laughs> like, there... That's just my best way to describe it. There's, there are, there if I go, if I go through, I'll go through a few of the criticisms I have so you can kind of see where my head was at with, with Andromeda, um, let's cons let's let's go with something simple like combat. the uh, The idea of favorites and being able to s being able to do full on class switching on paper should be a really good idea, but I never used it unless <laughs> unless I forced myself to use it, which is basically a LARP. And the reason for the reason for it, the reason, f at least for me, is the fact that. You look at class design in most RPGs, video game or otherwise, there's usually some sort of catch. Like if you're whether it whether it be stuff that you can't access or or stu or um or scenarios in combat that you should not be in. Like if you're playing if you're playing full adept, maybe maybe not focus entirely on nothing but shooting if you follow me. But the problem is, you can literally, you can, because of how it's set up, you can build a class with no downside. Because, the, because, um, think, because things like, things like Cryo can counter just about everything. And it's stupidly, and the enemy design doesn't have anything that can, har that can hard counter any of the kit. Yeah, I... I agree with that. I think that the the idea behind being able to like switch at will, I think, is interesting. Um, I just feel like again, it wasn't implemented the best. Um, I, it, but the thing is, like, I'm a I'm just a huge fan of being able to like have that flexibility because then you know, like, oh, like, hey, I want to know like this character more, but like, I'm already doing what they do. Let me just like swap over yeah. the thing. Think Having that flexibility is nice, but. What's the point of that amount of flexibility if you don't use it? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I I would one hundred percent agree with that one. Uh, but when it comes to con when it comes to conversation, um, I was I. What I find what I find amusing ab about the way that they have it set up is they 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 claim. The developers had claimed that they had set up conversation to focus more on tone than on than on a um on on an alignment chart because they wanted a character that people could relate to that people could connect with right out of the gate instead of somebody who 
already had a background. The pro the problem with that is that is that that's not the way that conversation system is designed. Mm -hmm. You're it's never been designed with the idea. You can't really do a voice protagonist while also having them be a blank slate. Right. Um. Uh, I feel like that's where, like, if you have like the like the Fallout three to four comparison, for example, I feel like that's kind of very similar to that because in four, I remember like when people like when that character was voiced and you had like these you know almost like Mass Effect style options, and I remember people just hated that so. Much. I'd say the other the other problem that you have is something that Lore Runner dubbed the Tor effect, where the choice that you end up making and what your character ends up saying don't match. That that is a personal annoyance of mine. Like I I despise when that happens so much. And then, like I just got done playing Cyberpunk 2077. And there were a few times that that happened. I was like I didn't I didn't want to say that. If I would have known that's what they were gonna say, I wouldn't have picked that option. Mm hmm And I I can contrast that with with say with say the way dialogue trees worked in something like um any any of the good Telltale games like The Walking Dead or The Wolf Among Us, or at least the first volumes of each. Uh, in each of those, the choices that you're making are things that you could say, but it's not. But it's not like you're doing some blank sl when you're playing as when you're playing The Wolf Among Us. You're not playing as a blank slate. You're playing as Bigby. Yeah. And Bigby is a defi is a defined character with defined traits. Can can he that he he can be he can be a nice guy he can be an asshole but but that's all up to the player. But it but even with those choices, it's not like you're playing somebody else. You're still playing Big B. Yeah. And with with Ryder, you don't really ha you don't really have that. Yeah, it just it, I feel like they tried and it just it doesn't quite work. I think that, like, you could take, like, your spin on Ryder, and it would be fine. But just, like, overall... Yeah. Uh, if, I was I put in, if I was put in charge of things, I would have had it that you're... that the protagonist you play as is Alec. Not... <laughs> because he actually... because he has a background that you can that you can build around as a introduction to Andromeda. Mm -hmm. Uh... Uh, gr granted, granted, some of the problems they walked into on their on their own because they refused to st state what and what ending of three is canon. And yeah, and I, I do think that like I remember that there was like a little like Easter egg that was like that this was going on like during the like the events of Mass Effect three. Like that's the whole reason why they like sent you out because they knew that Reapers were coming. And I thought that was like a, a neat little like detail to find. But, I, yeah, like, overall, I just feel like, I feel like there was a lot of potential with Andromeda, and it just, they, they fumbled with it, and it just, it makes me so nervous for the next Mass Effect game. Like, I want to like it, I really do, and I'm thinking about, like, revisiting Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 again, because, like, I have Legendary Edition uh, on my computer, but I just, I'm so nervous for the future of that yeah. series. Um. Although when it comes to Legendary Edition, fortunately, there's a healthy amount of gameplay mods to make to make things interesting. Yeah. Uh, include and for for me, for me, one of the important ones is making sure that the Crusader shotgun works the way I expect it to. Because I have I have a bit of a rule when it comes to shooters. If it if if it can have a good shotgun, it's probably going to be a good shooter. If it has a bad shotgun, it's probably going to be a bad shooter. <laughs> that that's the litmus test, but more often than not, it ends up proving right. Yeah, that's fair. And, and like and, and like almost no matter what game I'm playing on, like I'm going to play like a close quarters, like uh, like kind of combatant style. Of, like I mean, even with Cyberpunk, like my my first playthrough that I did, I went like. Full body, went gorilla arms with shotgun and like light machine gun as like my like go to setup. I'm like, you know what? This is fun. I don't even care if like I'm missing the nuance of the game. Like, why be stealthy when I can just kill somebody in two hits? Hey, hey, nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice. Exactly. Also known as the Steiner method of scouting. 
Yeah, that's fair. Because <laughs> remember, there is there is the right way, the wrong way, and the Steiner way, which is just the wrong way with more Atlas. God, that's how my uh, that's how my Veil group is going about things right now. To be fair, they are very very effective what they do, but oh my god, they have so much fun. Oh, although the last time that I ran the last time that I ran Veil of the Void, I ended up playing a mimic so for to whose job was to do one thing and one thing only piss everyone off and the mimic does that insanely well uh actually i had a player that was doing a mimic for a little while and then he told me that he wanted to change it out and this was like when the blade dancer was still like in play testing and uh, mm-hmm. i remember trevor had sent me over the documents he's like yeah you guys can go ahead and test this out if you want that's fine um and, and basically as soon as the blade dancer was like a thing and my players are like, I want that. I want to play that. And he's been playing that ever since. And I, I will say, though, that, like, the Mimic is very, like, annoying as a GM. But it does its job very well. The Soldier in the is just so overtuned starting out. Um, and, and they can do so much damage. I have a guy that's playing a sniper specialist, basically, and the amount of damage that he does per turn, and the fact that he crits almost every single attack, like, I just can't stop him. It does not matter, like, what I do. I can't get close enough to him, because he's just hitting him with sniper shots every round. Uh, is this a bad time to mention that I played a field knight who's whole... Whose um whole light whose whole idea was to be a battlefield linebacker or a battering ram? <laughs> oh, absolutely not. I mean, like <laughs> so, like I have only gotten a chance to play, uh, like actually be a player for Veil of the Void once. Did the exact same thing. I went with a uh, sword and shield, but I was just like slamming into everything that I could and just trying to do as much damage, like in like get in their face where they couldn't handle anything. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Uh. This is the. I even. <laughs> I even. I even called. I even called him. El, I even called him El. Um, El Toro because I want because, for for one, I like lucha libre, and two, um, I I I had this image in my mind of a bunch of field knights replicating the running of the bulls. Oh God! <laughs> yeah, and I mean, just based on lore, field knights would be the ones to do that. Yeah. Uh, when I did my deep dive. Um, in the Valley of the Judge series, I th- I think I made at least one Rocketeer joke because that's what came to mind. Yeah, and, and I will say that if anybody's listening and they don't really know what we're talking about, like mm-hmm. literally, I always describe the Field Knight as taking a barbarian and then strapping a jet back to it. Like it, it that's the easiest way that I can describe it. It's part mm-hmm. of my yeah. <clears throat> but I can see why he why that player of yours would want to go with the Blade Dancer because. The uh, up until that point, the class that f- that felt like it was the best represent representation of a gish was the mimic, but the blade dancer fits that a bit better. Yeah, yeah, and also it's just with the character that he wanted to play, like the blade dancer was just like the perfect calling for him, and he's always been the kind of person that like. He doesn't really do, like, strength-based characters. He's always, like, very dexterous. Like, he always likes playing that kind of, like, slightly sneaky person. And, like, his character has, like, grown quite a bit, especially with the group. But as soon as the battle starts, like, he's just teleporting all over the place. I just, it, again, I, I've been able to hold him in place one time, and that's because I had to throw something that was way too strong at the part, like, for what the party could do. And I, granted, I had to nerf it a little bit. But, like, I just ended up hitting him with one of his own spells because it was, like, the only way that I could actually get him to just, I was like, stop. Stop mm-hmm. moving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would I would say this is a bit ridiculous, but then I look at the um, Final Fantasy project I'm, de- I'm developing where we, where we intentionally encourage people to make ridiculous builds. Yeah, it, it, like, the thing, though, is that like, I encourage my players to do, like, anime, like, levels of bullshit, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, just because, like, if they can go over the top and they are having fun, like, I'm there to facilitate that. That's yeah. my job as a game master. Um, but it's funny you mention that because um, I remember in the early 2000s where I, I ended up pissing off a few people because I had the unmitigated gall to defend Tome of Battle. Um. If you don't recall, Tome of Battle, aka Tome of Battle, the Book of Nine Swords, aka Weeaboo Fightin' Magic, 
was a D and D third edition module um, expansion that introduced a maneuver system for martial characters, including the three new classes that were introduced. And each of the each of them was essentially essentially a a school of combat unto themselves. Um, and it's very cl- they were very upfront with the fact that they were heavily inspired by by a- by anime and and certain video games. I th- I think one of them even name dropped Devil May Cry at one point. And a lot of people saw this as either stepping in stepping onto the toes of mages, which is amusing when you consider the ridiculous amount of spells that mages ha- have in in D&D over the last few years. <laughs> or that or that it w- or that it was intro- or that it was turning D&D and making it to anime. And what I had said at the time, and I've said this on multiple occasions was you're going to have a whole generation of people who didn't get their introduction to fantasy through Lord of the Rings or through Conan or through Fathford and the Grey Mauser and so and so on. And the stuff that they end up making is going to reflect the stuff that they got introduced to fantasy with. And I think in the years since I've been validated in my assessment. Yeah, I yeah, I I definitely agree with that. I I'm so glad just to see that like because I try to follow like a bunch of like smaller projects, I do think that like we are kind of in this like golden age of like if there is a tabletop system, like if you want to do something with a tabletop system, you can probably find it at this point. And I think that that is awesome. I think that we have so many good games that are out there. Like I personally, I'm really excited to like get my hands on like Apocalypse Keys. Like, I love the idea of, like, being this, like, external, like, original threat, and then you're there, like, defending Earth from the apocalypse kind of thing. And it's all super narrative because, you know, we're using power by the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And granted, I haven't played with that system or, like, that rule set overly much. I've only really played Thirsty Sword Lesbians, and I'm gearing up to play some Monster of the Week at some point. Um, But, like... I love that system just because it's so simple and streamlined and, like, you just get, like, right into the narrative things. And because there aren't hard rules, like, saying what you can and can't do, you can describe it however you want. And I think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I've... I do, enjo- I do enjoy some... I do enjoy some um, Powered by the Apocalypse games. The... I'd... S- but if but if I'm being honest, the ones that I enjoy a bit more are when somebody takes the takes the core concept instead of just instead of just reflavoring the playbooks or the like, they they build onto they build onto it in some unique way, which apparently puts me on the out on the outs compared to a lot of folks in in that camp. Um, I think that having something that's super adaptable, like like the fact that like I've only played Thursday Sword Lesbians, right? But like looking at like Monster of the Week, I'm just like, okay, I know exactly like what I'm doing here, and I think that like that is good in itself. I do like the ones that like start to like twist the formula a little bit, like just from what I've looked over. Like, have you looked at Apocalypse Keys yet? Um, uh, not yet, not in detail. And the thing is, like, I've only glanced over it, right? But I think that one thing that's interesting is that, you know, like, the general rule when it comes to those Powered by the Apocalypse games is that if you get, like, a 10+, plus, it's, like, the best possible thing that you can do, right? But when it comes to Apocalypse Keys, is that because you are something that, like, you're the equivalent of, like, help, right? You would, instead of, like, getting the best possible result, you overdo it. So you succeed, but you still mess something up. So there's like a sweet spot that you're aiming for, and I think that that's just like it's just a little bit different than like what I'm used to. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I like that idea of the fact that like because you, you know, you let loose all of your supernatural power, you do the thing, but you do it a little too well, and then usually that in, like invokes some kind of detriment. I I like. Personally. You'd probably you'd probably get a kick out of um, fading suns. Okay. Especially, be- fading suns is main mechanic is what is what it calls um vi- is what it calls victory tw- victory twenty. Okay. I've I've nicknamed it over the years D twenty blackjack because the idea of the idea of it is your combination of attribute and skill is the 
DC that you're trying to roll under using just a D20. Okay. However, if you if you roll a, if you if you roll say a one, you succeed, but it's the most marginal of success. The goal is to try and get as close to the line without going over it. Hence, okay. D20 blackjack. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, of course, if if you manage to get just one ju just one point under, that's considered a, that's considered a the equivalent of a critical. Okay. Um, but if you get ri if you get right on the line, that's a botch. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. The problem right now is just I have too many games that I want to play and not enough time. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not gonna help. I'm not gonna help that matter. That matters because of the <laughs> sheer volume of of games in my library, which I can only summarize as you can't count that high. <laughs> See, the problem that I have is that like I like my my physical collection of books is relatively small. The number of PDFs that I have, on the other hand, though, like we're up in the uh, how many? Is it? It's like at least six hundred or so. I got um. Let me let me do let me let me do a check. <laughs> uh, I'm getting flexed on right now. <laughs> let's see. Okay, it's get. It's over a thousand, and it's going. Oh, Lord. it's over yeah, two thousand. <laughs> it's <win>. going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Like I like I like I said you like I said you can't count that high right now. I just I just did the I just did the properties thing right now. It's over. It's counted over um seven thousand. Oh my yeah! I don't know how you would even like remotely get even close to scratching the like a little bit of that, dear lord. <laughs> oh. but. I'm I'm not I'm not bringing that up to to try and not to try and knock you down a peg, but just to show that there's a lo there's a lot of options um, out there. Oh yeah. It, 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 really, I just, I just like the fact that it's like if you think you could do it in a tabletop game, you probably can, mm -hmm. and that's great. I absolutely yeah. love that. I um uh, I remember I remember when when um Paci when Pacific Rim came out. And a, bu a bunch of folks that I, that I knew wanted had asked me how you, how you'd adapt that kind of thing into um, tabletop. Um, I immediately pointed them to Cthulhu Tech. And while Cthulhu Tech has its issues with the with the way it handles dice, I've already fixed that at my table. Ah, uh, the but the the big reason I I brought up Cthulhu Tech to them is it's is it's you have you have a mix of Lovecraft, Macross, a little bit of Silent Mobius, and Giver. All right then. Which the designers did say that they had may, maybe um, maybe done a bit too much kitchen sink, which <laughs> I can I can see. But at the same time, um, if if you're gonna if you're gonna do the kitchen sink, don't half ass it. Yeah. Now, gr granted, I I know that um, I know that the guys who are doing Everyday Heroes are planning on having on having Pacific Rim as one of their setting books, but anybody who's doing that is going to have a challenge because how are you going to do the whole the whole two pilots one mech thing? So this is why I'm glad that I'm not a game designer. I just get to sit back and just enjoy what everybody else comes up with. <laughs> Well, I think I remember. I remember someone saying that translators have to translators for certain languages have to be writers just as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a similar thing can apply when it comes to GMing, and at times having having to be a game designer just as much. Well, I, I think that the closest that I've gotten to that is just like with some of the custom items that I've made, and like I've, I've done like a couple little like. 
little custom mechanics like Inveil the Void, for example. I mean, like I, I do have a couple of uh, items that are featured in the uh, in the rulebook as it is right now, actually, with the community spotlight section. And I've made way too many weapons as it is, or like pieces and stuff like that. And then just because like I'm like, okay, I like utility, and like at the moment, I don't really have things that offer that, so I'm just gonna make it. Um, is it balanced? Probably not. But at the same time, it works for my table, and that's just kind of my my overall philosophy is that if it works for my table and people are having fun with it and it doesn't, like, make my life miserable, like, I'm just going to make this thing and enjoy it. And then, like, if I put it out there for people, then I hope they enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. Which is the, is, the, is the way to do it, but um, somet sometimes, depending on the game, you, ha you have to... You have to be a little bit... Cre you have to be a little bit creative on matters. Yeah... Yeah, you do. <laughs> oh. And when in doubt, make shit up. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I do that frequently. It's just that it's... The number of times that, like, players have... Like, I will say, if you're a game master, and, like, if you genuinely need a minute to, like, think on how something will work, just tell your players, like, hey, I need a couple minutes, I need to step away from this just to think. Um, because the, the, the number of times that my players at my tables have been like, hey, I'm going to do this thing, and then they just see me have to, like, kind of, like, cross the hands and just be like, okay, how do we make this work? And then just, like, the I think they get a kick out of seeing my reaction because they always come up with the most broken bullshit to throw my way just to see how I react. And only the times I let it fly. Yeah. I rarely ever tell my players that. Uh, I will use... My, my approach isn't necessarily yes or no, but but more of yes, but... Yeah, I, I know it's either yes and or no but. Like I listen to, <laughs> I listen to so many different like advice podcasts right now. Like just because I'm like, there are always interesting perspectives. And like, hey, this is somebody that I, I respect in the field. Like, let's listen to their thoughts. And I think that like that that is the one thing that I've been like, really working on trying to adapt. Because when I first started, I was such a stickler for the rules, and now I'm just like, yeah, it's game make believe. Who cares? Well, the approach the approach that I've taken is that there is all. No matter is that there's always a catch. I'm a big fan of risk reward systems, and the big example that I that I give some I give somebody is um, I'm, is the is the um is the so, the sonic crossbow that I gave one that I gave one of my players um, once. Now you would think. It technically does. It technically does sonic damage, although it's sonic damage in a line instead of a single target. And and you would think that's a, that sounds pretty powerful. And you're technically correct. But here's here's where the catch comes in. Do you did you ever see Men in Black? Oh yeah. Do you remember the noisy cricket? Uh, how, it's like the most iconic gun. That. Like how how could you forget it? Oh, I love it! It totally kicks like a mule, right? Yeah, you fire the thing. You're gonna be on your you're gonna be on your ass about twenty feet away. Yeah, it, the funny thing is, like with my with my build one game, I actually did make uh, it because one of my players was just like, I want to have um, like I just want to have a really big gun. And I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, here here's a rail gun, and you can charge it up. And it does a lot of damage. Like, if you, like, charge it all the way, it's, like, a guaranteed, like, critical hit. Like, does massive amounts of damage. But it takes time to be able to do that. So, like, you can either, like, move, like, one square over while you're charging this thing, and then you're basically giving up some of your turns to be able to do massive amounts of damage. Or you can just fire it right away and do just a smaller amount. But, uh, like, the time... Like, there was one time you got the thing fully charged. And we just, like... Yeah, you basically leveled a building with it. Because, you know what? You took the time... Here you can have this. Is this a rail gun or a BFG? Oh, it was. It, I mean, this was a rail gun, but uh, it was just that the, where he placed the shot, it tore through the entire building. The guy they were fighting didn't really like that. It basically half helped him. It's one of those moments where you know, like the meme as the GM is just that you just like add an extra one to their health bar. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was. It was definitely one of those. Yeah. Um, and I've. Although my fav, my fav, I like giving my players very powerful but very unsafe weapons for themselves and for the enemy. Um, and then of course there's my infamous incident with the up button. Oh no! 
<laughs> I've mentioned the story on streams in the past, but it was it was a rune trap that worked very simple. You step on the thing, you go up. Technically speaking, it's like you're it's like you cast fly on yourself for six seconds at forty miles an hour. Oh lord. End of the campaign, a dragon ended up step in ended up stepping on the thing in a cave lined with adamantite. So <laughs> you know oh, that stuff's that not is, budging. That is one way to do it. Oh. And he ends up hitting the ceiling the first time, which certainly t certainly is going to take some HP, but not kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then I immediately say to the GM, um, "That's on it's only been one second. There's still five more seconds to go." He's like, "It's adamantite. That's not. He's not going to break through that. Does doesn't matter. <laughs> the spell uh, says you yeah. go up. The spell says you go up. So." He basically became he basically became what happens when you put a car into a compactor. <laughs> oh, I feel like that's a war crime. Uh, well, ev everybody had to take con <laughs> saves after that to prevent to prevent from projectile vomiting because they just I saw mean, a dr they just saw yeah, a adult that, dra adult dragon get crushed. Oh god, yeah, that's paste right there. Mm -hmm. Oh god. Uh it it certainly hit, it certainly helped that some that some of the players had had been familiar with the not with the um I think I think it was yeah I think it was um nightmare ga nightmare game show in the UK back in the day so immediately one of them goes ooh nasty <laughs> uh, because I am not ashamed to admit how many things I have stolen from from Looney Tunes when it comes to coming up with traps. You know, it, the funny thing about that is that, like, the the dungeon master in my home D and D game is that he has this quote, and I I, I know I'm going to butcher it, but it's just like, yeah, how does it go? It's something. It's like you can. It, it's like the best things that you can put in are the most obscure references. Mm -hmm. And like the amount of stuff that like I, like I always pull stuff in from either the books that I'm reading or just like things that I'm just really enjoying at the moment. And like the amount of stuff that he's done that like with our home D and D game is like honestly absurd. And it, I'm just always on the lookout. I'm like, okay, am I gonna get this? Is this a reference to something? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of referential humor when it comes to geek culture as a whole. Yeah. Oh. Um. Which is which is why it do, it doesn't take. I have one of my litmus tests is that the longer a, the longer a game goes on, the probability that someone's going to make a Monty Python joke approaches one. <laughs> More so nowadays because of the recent announcement of the Monty Python um, extracurricular historical extracurricular whatever whatever basically saying that it is not an RPG. Although the producers insist that I must say that yes, it is an RPG. Ah, <laughs> uh, complete, complete with a side, complete with a side board game called Fete la Vache. Well, that's real bad French. Uh, oh God, I know it. I know it. Oh my God, are you shooting cows at people? Yes. <sighs> Which I I'd say is ridiculous, but then I remember. Wait, I played Earthworm Jim as a kid. <laughs> with one of the with one of the greatest troll moves of that of that era when it comes to the cow launcher, or the or the lo or the longest Chekhov's gun. <laughs> oh, God. I, yeah, I will say one, one of my players wanted to make a uh, a tractor beam, and he wanted to actually be able to shoot tractors out of a beam. And I had to specifically tell him, "No, you cannot put that on your ship. It's not existing in my game." This isn't the Looney Tales. I'm sorry. We're going for Mass Effect, not Looney Tales. Um, I did have I did have one case where I punished somebody because they miswrote they miswrote on the, they miswrote on their um spell list. So when they tried to when they tried so they were they were very mad at me when I said you summon a block of cheese because the way they wrote the way they they miswrote monster as monster. Oh. <laughs> You know, the funny thing about that, that just instantly makes me think of the Dungeons & Daddies podcast, because they, at one point, had an item 
where they could only use it a certain amount of times per day, and there was a chance it would just break right away, but you could change, like, two letters in a spell to mm -hmm. change the effect of it entirely. I was like, that's going to break a campaign, and the item broke right away, but it was absolutely hilarious when they used it. Yeah. But, and gr granted... Granted, in that particular case, that the player in question was was a rules lawyer, and I take I take a certain sadistic amount of joy in um tro in trolling rules lawyers. Yeah, I mean, I I, I get it. I just it, personally, I just try to like when I'm sitting down and play a tabletop games, and I'm just like, I only have so much time to do this. I just want to have as much fun as possible. Like, I'm not the biggest stickler for the rules, but I'm not going to, like, go on personally to, like, like bend or break stuff just to, like, annoy somebody. That's just not really who I am. Like, I always, like, I try to think of other people as much as possible, if I'm honest. Yeah, but... And to be, to be fair, to be fair... Being a rules lawyer as a as a player is just a bit of is just a bit of a dick move because all that you're gonna do is frustrate the GM when you start arguing about the interpretation of rules. Yeah, and that I definitely agree with. I think that like if you're gonna do that, like if you have the the possibility to like talk to the GM like in private, like so because I'm like only playing online these days. Like, if I have a question, like, to my DM, like, I'll just, like, I will just shoot him a quick private message, like, hey, like, just so you know, like, this is a thing. Um, and then, like, we just do, like, a quick, like, a quick timeout, and then we'll, we'll, like, confer together. So that way it is more collaborative. Like, mm -hmm. don't don't be that kind of person that's just, like, um, no, you're wrong, and, like, push the glasses up kind of thing. Like, it, there's no reason to be, either, like, antagonistic about that. Like, we're all sitting down just trying to play a game and have fun. Like, yeah. don't be a dick. Uh, I did, because of the fact that I like, I like bringing out props i did i when somebody did the no you're wrong da, 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 i did i did bring out a a book a um a mock-up of a book that said that says why i'm all why i'm always right by mildred the monk <laughs> so i was like wait i'm wrong let me check the book there nope you go. nope the book said the book says that i'm right so i'm right <laughs> Yeah, it, it, what's funny is that I have actually had, like, uh, with one of my games uh, that I run, I have had somebody be like, hey, like, is this how this actually works? I'm like, so generally this is how it works, but I don't personally like that rule. This is what I do at my table. And then I just am very clear in explaining that, like, I do things differently just mm -hmm. because, like, like for example, I hate encumbrance. I don't ever include it with my games. Preach, just, brother, preach! I don't like it. Like, look, let me carry my 8,000 pounds of, like, 400 swords, okay? Like, am I going to use them? No. Do I have a reason to have that many? No. But you know what? I'm not thinking about it all the time. Like, so I'm, I'm just there to have fun. Like, I'm sorry that my way of playing make-believe doesn't really match your way of playing make-believe. Uh, I think we had... I think, I think in one campaign we had one person who... Um, through through creative uses of a of a portal gun and about and about five thousand flasks of alchemist fire gave a gave a um gave a cave troll the worst case of indigestion you can ever have. God. <laughs> uh, I I will say though, like one time as a like by sheer manipulation of the rules, I still feel bad for for my dungeon master because we were doing as a team and. Came he had made this, like extensive dungeon that we were supposed to like do a dungeon crawl through, and then one we had one player where we had just killed a couple of dragons. And he's like, "Hey, wait a second, these are adult dragons, right?" He's like, yeah. he's like, "So what's stopping us from like cutting them open?" And we have a war forge, so he can just like walk along the bottom of like this river thing, and the rest of everyone can get in the dragon lungs that we cut out, and then we could just bypass this whole thing, right? And I, and, uh, like, oh, Alex, if you're hearing this. Like, I'm still sorry that we did that to you. I wasn't in on it, necessarily. I just went with the flow, okay? Like, I'm sorry that we bypassed your very beautiful dungeon that you worked very, very hard on. I saw the light leave this man <laughs> for a brief moment. Because, and the thing is that because Warforged technically don't need to breathe, and he was metal, and, like, he set himself in his heaviest form, so he just could walk along the bottom of this, like, underground river thing... The DM allowed it to happen, just wasting two weeks worth of prep. And I still feel bad about that, but it is one of the things that are so when like when something ridiculous happens, we all just go dragon lungs, and that's 
literally like doused the thing with her. Yeah. Um. The only t I have had a few cases where I've had to punish players for doing for doing something stupid, but that's usually. But um, either a the dice will the dice will do my job for me, or b, um, everybody I've already developed a reputation when it comes to the punishment game, which is only reserved whenever somebody gets caught cheating or if they do something ridiculously dumb that results in a wipe. Yeah, uh, so I haven't ever had to like really like punish players, though I did actually have like a moment of like sweet justice, and this was actually in a very recent mm -hmm. game. Um, I was basically running this like little like one-off thing because I was doing this Mass Effect style like character mission thing, and one of my players wanted to basically just fight a bunch of demons. So you know, I facilitated that, made it work, and then like you know, I have my bad guy for like my big person uh, mm -hmm. for that mission doing the monologue, and then one of my players is playing a scoundrel and uh, or a smuggler in Vale, and he's like, I'm gonna shoot him in the face. I'm like, okay, you know what? Go ahead, roll to shoot. And, and, like, as soon as he hit, I'm like, you know what? I'll just go ahead and I'll let you go ahead and get a crit here. Have the sex and everything like that. Because, you know, they didn't know he had 1,200 health. So he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I hit him for, like, 40-something damage. And I'm like, and he's going to attack you. Instant crit, 52 damage, drop the player instantly. And I'm like, you should have let me finish. So one time I've done that. And I'm like, okay, that felt good. I don't I don't mind that one. <laughs> mm hmm And... To be fair, to be fair, the it's not like the punishment game is all that painful. It's it's um you have to drink a bottle of bacon soda. It's it, it's a offshoot of the fact that whenever whenever um whenever I'd I'd bring people over to play like Goldeneye back in the day, uh, we had a rule that if you picked odd job, everybody was allowed to punch to punch you below the belt once. Oh god. My mindset was I'm gonna make a make the punishment far so far worse than the crime that nobody would think about it. Yeah. Because because if if you played Goldeneye back on back in the N sixty four days, you know the pain of somebody picking odd job and just going right under everybody's shots. Yeah, it, you know the funny thing is that I know about it. Never played the game actually. Mm -hmm. Like that was uh, that was uh, just slightly before my time. I like I was very late to like the N sixty four day, and I think like at that point like the PS two was already like you know very prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never never played Goldeneye. But uh, you know it's one that I don't really have much of a desire to to revisit just because I've seen how it has not aged well in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, but yeah. I know the stories, though, and I know that if you pick a job, that's just a dick move. <laughs> yeah, uh, and there certain certain competitive games have that character who, if you pick them, you're a, you're a dick. Um, like Met back back in the days of Brawl, if you picked Meta Knight, everybody hated you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one uh, I get. Mm -hmm. Oh. If, I remember, I remember Tekken three. If you pick, if you picked Eddie, everybody hated you. <laughs> but when it, but the the, of course the the plan B is what's known as the plan B when it comes to the punishment game is the pain glass, which is a shot glass filled with like three different three or four different forms of hot sauce. Along with along with salt, sea salt, pepper, and black pepper. Oh God! Um, sometimes, if I can get it, I'll put I'll put a little bit of wasabi in it. Oh, God. If that sounds disgusting, well, it's because it is. Ah, uh, yeah, that sounds awful. But if I'm gonna call it the pain glass, I can't half-ass it. <laughs> oh, fair enough. But when. When you mentioned um, when you when you mentioned do um, having a preference for um, sp for space opera in, and the like, uh, does that also apply to the to the non RPG stuff that you might that you might consume? Like, do you see your, would would you see yourself watching a a hard a hard SF series? I mean, I think like the closest to that is like. Like, I love The Expanse. Like, I'm on season, I think, four of that right now. Um, 
But like you know, I I like a good like sci-fi anime. Like I I will watch like as long as I can have fun with it, I mm-hmm. will probably watch it. I read uh it, I read a lot actually, and I will say that um uh crap I can never remember the the first book in the series even though I absolutely loved it. Uh, the Last Watch by J S Dude. Mm-hmm. Um really really fun book. Absolutely loved it, and it it's exactly like the hardest of sci-fi. Um, and that just because it still has like some of those like kind of fantasy elements in there because you know the universe itself is like shrinking kind of thing. Uh, but really, really good book. Um, like let's see, another book series I really liked was like uh, the Murphy Diaries. Um, if you haven't read those, mm-hmm. highly recommend it. Really, really fun time, and they were like really, really short, so you get through them in like a couple of hours. Um, but yeah, I, I would say like that's kind of like a general theme that I like going for. Like I don't necessarily like something where it's like having to explain like all the physics behind something i'm just like look i just want to see lasers and things blow up like i'm, I'm a very simple person <laughs> so no time travel i got i got gotcha. you uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it, it, depends. it depends um i will say that like uh there's a book called dark matter that deals with like parallel dimensions and that one was really really fun and a little trippy but mm-hmm. um it, it like I, I enjoy some time travel stuff. In fact, I'm actually uh, listening to a book right now that incorporates some of that. But it, just for the most part, like I enjoy my fiction to be like really more on the fantasy side of things because then it is kind of that escapist. It's just like I can turn my brain off and just like really just enjoy the story that's before me. And like if I want to be like very thoughtful on something, I will. But it's not usually like if I'm consuming media. I'm just doing it because it's it's fun, it's pleasurable, and it's a way for me to just kind of relax. Mm-hmm. Oh. I had I had to I had to bring that up because well, time travel is a minefield <laughs> in in the in the figurative and sometimes literal sense because the sheer amount of paradoxes that can happen with time travel can make even good even stories I like that use it fall under their own weight. Yeah. Like, the closest thing that anybody's gotten to getting time travel, quote-unquote, right is Primer. Okay. And Primer came out in, like, 2004. It was it was a, it was was a an indie film that came out around that time that went out of its way to nail, to nail down its rules with time travel. Thing about that is that literally, I just heard that mentioned on like one of the podcasts I was. I think it was. I actually think it was the Dungeons and Daddies podcast. Like they reference it at one point, and the, that's just weird that I've heard that reference twice now in like a week. Mm-hmm. Oh, and tr- although so, although some people might say I'm not consistent with that because I've mentioned my, the story that has my favorite use of time travel is um, the Legacy of Cain series. Okay. Um, uh, I think it's because of the fact that I think people overlook it because of the, or rather, or rather, think that it's a contradiction because of the rules that time travel has. One of the, the main rule that it, the main rule that it has is can is essentially if you go, if you go back and change history, then you then um you didn't. In other in other words, history self self corrects constantly when the timeline is changed. Of course, of course, that's a vast simplification, and the legacy of Kane games are a fascinating rabbit hole to go down into. But the since you mentioned it, I do maintain that Titanfall Two has the best use of time travel when it comes to the actual game part. Yeah, uh, I, I, and the funny thing is, like, that is, like, the iconic level of that entire game, and it is so, so good. I would argue, like, there is an interesting use of time travel in uh, Dishonored 2, if you played that one as well. I, I have, but I still put, I still put that level in Titanfall 2 on, on a, on a higher pedestal, because... Oh, absolutely, it is, so, it, it is much more fun, in mm-hmm. my opinion, and it, just, it is very, very well done. Because... It's been a while since Dishonored 2, but I remember its use of time travel being um, amounting to amounting to a power or set pieces, which is nice, but 
you can do better. It, it was like one level. You got this new item specifically so you could like traverse this mansion and then find out like what happened in the past kind of thing. Um, That's it, a set piece. Yeah, yeah. And but even then, like it's fun. It's not my favorite level of that game uh, by any means, but it, it is what it is. Well, I've seen some. Pe- I I remember some people saying that Dishonored was a could be considered the spiritual successor to Thief. I don't quite see it that way because Thief, because the Thief games, bar, barring the attempt at a remake in the 2010s, we don't talk about that, are trying to be a pure stealth game. When you when you have to be a stealth action game, you have to play, you have to play a balancing act between the stealth part and the combat part. And in something like Thief, it is purely st- it is it is purely reliant on stealth. You have some combat ability, but it's generally advised to not get into a sword fight. Yeah, I, yeah, I totally get that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you can handle a you can handle a couple. Pe- it has a nice little parrying system, and you can handle a couple people, but. Once the alarms raised, more and more people are going to come in, and they get really fast. <laughs> Just run. Yeah, and most of most of the encounters are are more often going to be solved by either not starting fights or or try or finding ways to knock them out with a blackjack. Yeah. Or or knocking them out with diff, with different types of arrows. And. In that in that in that regard, you could probably use Garrett from the Thief games as a good example of the arcane archer archetype. But even even though he's not using spells with them, yeah, you... and uh, I've heard that one's underwhelming. It's not stopping me from wanting to play one though. Like I just I really I know that it's not the best. Don't really care. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, with I do I I do want I do want to take a look at. Even though I have it in my library, the um dis- the Dishonored TTRPG that Modifist made, because I'm trying to figure out how how are you going to do that without running into the main character problem, or uh, so the funny thing about that is that that is also on my shelf. Uh, it is one of the games that I really, really, really want to run, and I'd hope to run it this year. But at this point, it's not really looking like it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But uh, I do like the fact that they have they have stat blocks in there. For the main characters, like there is a stat block for Corvo Otano. There is one for Emily Caldwin. Uh, depending on like when you're wanting to like you know like set the mm-hmm. arrow because there's a ton of lore in there. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's they they even have ideas on like how to incorporate them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will say that if you run into either of those characters and you are on their bad side, they will murder your character. It does not matter. You can't keep up with them. Yeah. Well. What I mean by the main character problem is, it's also the reason why when when I would run um, Star Wars campaigns, um, somebody would have to make make a damn damn good case if they wanted to play a Jedi if I was do it, if I was setting it say in between episodes three and four, mm-hmm. and the reason why I had that attitude is best des- is best described with. Um, Ralph Coster's experiences designing um, Star Wars Galaxies, because he he was a, he fought for years against putting Jedi in that game, and his reason for that was he felt that Jedi would become an alpha class, that because everybody wants to be Luke Skywalker, people would want would want to jump straight into being a Jedi and not engage with the um, sandbox economy that Star Wars Galaxies was built around. Well, I think when it comes to Dishonored, like, it, because there are a ton of powers that are listed, it even does tell you, though, that, like, keep that limited to, like, one person can have access to maybe one of those powers. Um, and that's probably about the extent that you're going to do. Everybody else, like, you have to be people. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just that, like, blessings from the outsider in terms of Dishonored lore are insanely rare. Like so, it's very easy to justify. Like you guys are just normal people. If you don't include the powers, they're not there. Problem mm-hmm. solved. Uh, as an as an aside, I always thought it was kind of strange that Corvo Atano was a silent protagonist. 
Yeah, that's why I like that they gave him a voice in Dishonored 2. Uh, honestly, I thought that like it gave him a lot more character. I was a big fan. It was like I love Dishonored so much. That's my major gripe. That was the fact that he doesn't say anything. Well, I a while back on the podcast, we did a whole episode talking about the about the conundrum with silent protagonists in video games, and. Some the idea with the idea of a silent protagonist on paper is that it is that it's supposed to be a char- a character who is meant to be that blank slate that like I mentioned when it comes to Ryder in um, Mass Effect. Mm-hmm. The problem is when you give them a certain degree of in-universe background, it is it becomes harder and harder for them to be that blank slate. Yeah. Uh one of the be- one of the best examples for me is RTM from the Metro games. Like they tr- they try to they try to have him as the as a silent as a silent protagonist. Dis- at least at least when it comes to actual gameplay, I'm not I'm not counting the loading screens in between chapters. But and a- and actually and actually the loading screen thing makes that makes the problem even more noticeable. But. <laughs> He is, but he is not a. Bl- you can have him be an audience surrogate, maybe, especially with twenty thirty three. But a silent protagonist, when he's the, when he is responsible for so much direct action within the story, mm-hmm. and the relationship with Anna, it doesn't work. Yeah, I I I agree with that. And I, again, I think that's just like the one fault of that game. Everything mm-hmm. else, I love it. Yeah. And hell, I've, I've, if I'm, if I can say something controversial, I'm hoping that a future Legend of Zelda game doesn't have Link as a silent protagonist. I no, really, I, I would really like that too. I think that they are starting to go in the right direction, especially because you know now we have like with Breath of the Wild, we had like fully voiced uh, Zelda. Like I think that we're getting more voice cast. I would love to see like a Link that can talk. Like mm-hmm. I, I'm sure that that would probably like. That some people like, you know, up in arms and stuff like that because it doesn't sound the way that they thought he would. But I just want to see—I want to see him have opinions. That's all I want. Well, the problem—the problem with say Link in Breath of the Wild is with the back with the background that he has, having him be silent um, creates a disconnect more than it connects. Especially when you're, especially when people are asking you questions and you ha- and you have those multiple choice answers. Mm-hmm. Like it's hard it's hard to it's hard it's hard to it's hard to have it's hard to not have a personality with that. Yeah. Uh, plus I th- plus I think it's just a air it's just an unexplored area. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Then I know. Th- I know. Th- once again, I know that the argument is that it, that it's supposed to be designed in a way that anybody can can be put in Link's shoes. But if you look at the way Link has been designed, just visually, that hasn't been the case for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the truth. I'd say I'd say it hasn't been the case since Zelda went 3D. Yeah, yeah, and granted, I've really only played a handful of, of Zelda games. It's just that, like, I didn't really have access to, like, a Nintendo system. I mean, like, Ocarina of Time was my introduction to it, and then I played Breath of the Wild, and then I'm, like, just starting into Majora's Mask because I have that on my Switch. Yeah. And Majora's Mask is an interesting case because it... In its, in its early days, it got a lot of flack, but in the time since, it's gotten something of a reevaluation. Even though, even though the shoot, even though the shooting gallery and originally was a pain in the ass, <laughs> you know, you're have, doing a speed challenge with that kind of with those kind of precise controls is a bit of an ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't, I haven't played the, ver- I haven't played the Switch version. The last one I played was the one on the 3DS, which had gyroscopic aiming, and I. Well, I beat the game in three days. <laughs> I, ro- I am uh, I'm aware of the irony. 
Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's all right on on the Switch. I, granted, I've only played like maybe a couple of hours. Like I'm really like just getting into it, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, I, I just want to give it a shot. It's one that I wanted to play, and I just never did. Yeah, but with that, with that in with that in mind, um. I know that you d- you recently did a video diving into the easy mode for Cyberpunk Red. Are you are you planning on doing a chapter by chapter breakdown like you've done in the past? Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be necessarily like a chapter by chapter thing, um, but I am planning on doing more of a deep dive. I think that it will be starting with like how do you actually build a character? I know that with the the video that I did, that's kind of like the introduction to Cyberpunk. Um, it was it gave the basic description on how to do that and the three different like forms of character creation so like i want to dive into that a little bit more i want people to see that hey like making character in cyberpunk isn't all that hard um i want to dive into the lore a little bit more um but in terms of like how in-depth we're going to get it it's probably not going to be to the, quite the same extent that uh that like veil the void was just because like the roles in cyberpunk red are very different than a lot of classes in other role-playing games. And even then, like, I don't do, like, super in-depth, like, here's every single thing that you get at every single level with every single, like, class type, just because, for me, I don't want to just, like, read out of the book for people. I just want to give a a summary as to what they can expect. Now, will I revisit the character roles? Probably, just because I think that, like, when people see, like, what the difference between, like, a, like, a first role like a role level one and like a role level 10 is that they can see that oh it's like you're some punk rocker who can barely get a gig in a bar and then you have somebody that is literally like leading like a worldwide cult through their music i think that like being able to highlight that would be something cool for people to see um but in terms of like how far we're gonna be going into this i'm still not entirely sure yet i'm just like really getting started with covering cyberpunk mm-hmm. well it's fun it's funny you mentioned that because a while back we dealt we um we delved into the life path system with Cyberpunk 2020, and it ended up becoming, um, how long how long is it gonna take before before we before we have a character who has way too big of a family? I think in oh, one yeah. case we had somebody with like seven siblings. Oh lord, okay. <laughs> I mean. Could be worse. My dad was one of ten. So, <laughs> uh, and we've done we did the same thing with the with the Witcher, which resulted in um, friend of the show Doku being a being an elven merchant who dresses who dresses um, ridiculously flashy, and somehow he got it in his head that he ha- that he has a bejeweled codpiece that somehow doubles as a violin string. Not really the direction I would go with it, but you know what? It works. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and ev- ever since he's had the gag of, can I introduce you in this fu- in this bejeweled used cod piece? Oh my god! <laughs> because do- because Doku is worse than me. Oh lord! <laughs> he's also always late and usually drinking. <laughs> and whenever he show whenever he shows up for the for these shows, um, things get derailed very quickly because. I seem to surround myself with chaos. <laughs> but with all with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play at play here. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I know that like when I saw that you started covering like Veil of the Void and like. You know, just like, okay, it's somebody else sitting in these games. Like, we need more people to play these because then that means that these games get more recognition, and then that means I have more people to talk about these games with. So I love mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and well, I, ha- I have some stuff in mind. I'm working. With, I'm working on when it comes to Emberwind that I've talked about, but that's enough. That's a whole other matter. But and of course, of course, anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, 
on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!